Hello everybody, AEW Dark Review here on Pro Wrestling Logic for the 21st of um, October 19, or 2020, 1920? No, would be a while ago. Anyway, I mean, not a bad show, and there are things on here I really, really liked. There are things in here that I didn't. There are also things in here that make me scratch my head about this company, and that makes me sad because I am a... a, a pretty major AEW fan. I like at least 80% of the things they do. Excalibur, Jim Ross, and Tony Schiavone are your announcers for the day. We start with the World Title Elim Elimination 8-Man Tournament. Uh, Wardlow and Jungle Boy in the opening match. Good opener. Wardlow doesn't usually get a lot of singles time. He does here. Good match for him. Jungle Boy gets a little bit of shine early. Uh, hits, hits some strikes and drop kicks. Wardlow cuts him off, and a uh, attempted run on the apron fails for Jungle Boy. Wardlow uh, is very dominant of Jungle Boy. Uh, Jungle Boy does make a comeback, including a suicide tope, a rana, and a and some double knees for near fall. Wardlow cuts him off a second time. Hits a massive F10 for the pinfall. He advances to the next round of the tournament. Um, there is a amazing promo from Eddie Kingston uh, after Dynamite went off the air last week, basically mocking him for making millions of dollars in the land of the entertainers while leaving Kingston and others like Kingston behind, basically calling him a sellout. Kingston said he died for pro wrestling and he's going to make Moxley quit. I hope this leads to somebody relevant to the promotion joining with Kingston in the end. Um, they announce a Moxley versus Kingston I quit match at the Full Gear pay-per-view. I'm not a fan of this. Let me explain why. If you want people to buy a pay-per-view, you have to give them marquee matches for your championships. While I'm not against uh, um, Eddie Kingston wrestling again in a television setting, while I'm also not against Eddie Kingston becoming more of a viable manager, I am against him getting a, a main event or semi-main event spot in a pay-per-view. That does not bode well for where the company is going and I think this is one of those things where they're following something that is good too far unless it leads to a heel turn of an established talent talent joining with Eddie Kingston um I'm thinking I'd love to see Kenny Omega or yeah Kenny Omega have Eddie Kingston as a mouthpiece as as Omega not being the guy who ever sold out, the guy who went to Japan and, and stayed loyal and look where he is now, that kind of thing. I think that would pay this off well, but if it's just to throw this in into a championship match on a pay-per-view, I'm not a fan. Moxley cuts a pre-tape promo on Kingston. He, he said he's not going to apologize for buying a home for his family, nor should he. He promised to beat Kingston so badly he'd either get his old friend back or he'd beat him into submission and he would quit. Omega gets a heel entrance for this. Um, he's got dancing girls, which he doesn't need. Uh, brooms, which he could buy at the Dollar Tree. And Justin Roberts listed his Observer and Pro Wrestling accolades, which the people at home don't care about. However... All of these things made me not like Kenny Omega, so mission accomplished. Not that I liked him before, but I like him even less now. Anyway, uh, world title elimination. Omega wins in less than 30 seconds. Hits a V-trigger and a one-winged angel for the win on Sunny Kiss. Keep in mind, this was supposed to be Joey Janela. Janela was affected by COVID, or exposed to COVID more accurately, so he is out and Sunny Kiss is in. With all the enhancement talent they could have had, I really wish they'd used someone other than Kiss for the spot, but it does the thing that it needs to do for the advancement of the Kenny Omega story. Uh, Tony Schiavone interviews Orange Cassidy. Cassidy uh, downplays his loss to uh, others. 
and says he's going to be okay when he fights again. Um, Dasha interviews Cody and Arn arriving at the building. Cody, Cody says he's heard stipulations added to his TNT title defense against Cassidy next week. He said he's gained weight on his hiatus because he wants to be more of a heavyweight. And he's um, a giant killer. And he says it's time to go into heavyweight mode. Um, I think this is leading towards Cody turning heel. I'm hoping they, they carry it out. My preference would be till the the first pay-per-view of 2020, which I think would be like April or May, um, carried out over several months. Uh, Eddie Kingston cuts a second promo on Moxley. He said he hates when what he's become, but he had to become a snake in order to survive. He said he's being being a nice guy got him nowhere. And his current attitude's gotten him world title matches on pay-per-views. Makes sense. Um, then we go to Ray Phoenix and Penta against each other. This, <sighs> number one, I'm learning how much I don't like Lucha. Um, everyone online is raving about this match. And if you like Lucha, you'll probably enjoy it. I thought this was too much flippy floppy, floopy fly. And also... This is a tag team that could have been in your tag four-way. Why not have two other guys in this match? Um, so, Phoenix lands awkwardly after a top rope run. A referee checks on him. I mean, they do a bunch of really cool back-and-forth spots and kicks and strikes and just amazing stuff. Um, but Phoenix looks out of it for a while. Um, and then Phoenix hits a Toledo off the post. Penta misses a chop, punches the post. After top rope, Rana Penta takes over. They trade a series of near falls. Phoenix hits a destroyer, gets the win. Um, obviously Phoenix isn't going to win the tournament, so who won this match really doesn't matter. But again, the fact that Eddie Kingston, who's on commentary during this, doesn't say, you're trying to break up my team, you're trying to break up my friends, how dare the evil company, I think is a missed opportunity. Um, they do a video package to recap Miro and Kip Sabian versus Best Friends. Best Friends said they didn't mean to destroy the arcade game. I don't think anyone cares either way. Alex Marvez, otherwise known as the the unneeded to be employed Alex Marvez, interviews Colt Cabana, Alex Reynolds, and John Silver about Dark Order's big matches. Reynolds says that Brody Lee taught them to overcome adversity. Silver did a little of the BTE stuff, and if you don't watch BTE, and I don't anymore, there's too many things going on in my in my job, too many things going on for this channel and other things I have going on in my life. It, it doesn't translate. Anyway, World Title Elimination Tournament. First round, Hangman Page defeats Colt Kamana. Not a bad match, but I think Page could have used a better victory. Meaning, something a little quicker, something a little more decisive. Uh, Page does show off some power spots early. Kamana cuts him off, and they go through commercial... Uh, Paige avoids a skyline and kicks out of the Superman pin. Paige misses the buckshot lariat a couple times. Cabana steps away. Paige hits the buckshot, gets the pin. So Paige advances. Um, they continue to hype the goofy Matt Hardy mystery attacker thing. Team Taz comes on stage for a promo. Taz is probably one of the better promos in the business even now. Says Team Taz has two problems, Will Hobbs, Hobbs and Darby Allen. Taz says he hasn't heard back from Hobbs. Uh, he says he needs an answer. Taz says he talked to Tony Khan and says that Starks, if he had beaten Allen weeks ago, he could have had the shot at the TNT title at full gear. Duh. He says that burns him up. Starks cuts an awesome promo on Allen and... I think Ricky Starks could be a breakout star for AEW over the next two years. That's my gut feeling. Uh, Lay Dinner, Debonair. This is either going to hit with some people. <laughs> I'm 
by the end, the Jericho MJF thing kind of hit with me in a this is so bad it's good kind of way. It's not something I would have put on my TV. Um, they do one upsmanship over who has their, their stake more mooing. They break into a Me and My Shadow song and dance routine. They change the lyrics to make fun of all the baby faces in the company. They basically did a mini musical, which it was fun, but I'm not sure that it does anything for wrestling fans. I will be, will be interested in, to see if people tuned out in droves for this or if, if the AEW audience liked it. I'm actually intrigued because... I like both guys, so I would have stayed anyway, but if I didn't like one of them and there's another wrestling show on, I would have flipped channels at this moment. Anyway, um, there will be a town town hall meeting next week with the Inner Circle, um, and so Tony Schiavone is going to moderate this. This will be the discussion about whether MJF should join the Inner Circle. Um... So anyway, it's it's a very polarizing segment, and um, women's match, Britt Baker and Kylan King. First of all, Kylan King was on Dark last night. Why do we need to see her twice in 24 hours? Stiff squash by Britt Baker. Baker needs to be the women's champion. Be all, end all, done all, yay. Um, flatliner and a curve stomp and a lock jaw for the submission victory for Baker. This happens quickly. Next week, Hangman Page and Wardlow and Kenny Omega and Ray Phoenix, Taya Conte and Abaddon, Cody and Orange Cassidy in a lumberjack match, and the Inner Circle Town Hall are all announced. Matt Hardy and Sammy Guevara. In the Elite Deletion matches announced for Full Gear. I do not want to see Hardy and Guevara again. This does not make me happy. Darby Allen versus the TNT Champion and Moxie versus Kingston were announced for the pay-per-view. FDR versus the winners of tonight's main event. The AEW um, tag titles will be announced at Full Gear. Steve-O, whoever that is, appears in, in Darby Allen's vignette. Allen rolls down a skateboard uh, half pipe in a body bag. I don't know why. I don't know why this would make anyone care more or less about Darby Allen than he does dumb things week after week. Um, I enjoy Darby Allen as a wrestler. I think there's a story to be told with his character. I'm not sure that routinely injuring himself or trying to is the story they want to tell. Anyway, um... Kingston brings the bunny back to the Butcher and the Blade act, airs as the Butcher and Blade enter for the main event. I do not know why the Butcher and the Blade are in the main event. I do not know why this four-way tag is makes me really wonder about them bragging about the tag division. FTR on commentary for the match. Number one contenders match for the AEW Tag Team Championship. The winners go on to the full gear pay-per-view. Um... Against FDR for the belts. Anyway, Young Bucks defeat Private Party with Matt Hardy. Hey, that rhymed. Butcher and the Blade and Alex Randles and John Silver. If you have the best tag division in North American wrestling or in wrestling period, why do I not care about anybody but the Young Bucks in this match? Uh, people are polarized by this. They say it was a good match, and it's a good spot. It's fine. But it's not something that if I had a friend that was on the on the brink of not watching AEW or watching AEW, I would not show them this match. Um, so the Bucks dominate the early part of the match. Nick and Cassidy have a decent exchange. I still don't get the private party thing, so maybe that clouds my judgment a bit. Butcher and Blade I wouldn't even have on my roster, so that doesn't help. Um, so... Mark Quinn runs absolutely nuts. Commercial break. Sammy Guevara jumps the barricade and attacks Matt, Har Matt Hardy during the commercial break. I guess if we care about this, we should care. Silver and Reynolds try to recruit Butcher and Blade during the match. Bunny jumps on the apron, distracts them. Butcher and Blade remain in control. Um, Silver and Reynolds 
basically have, and to be fair, I like Silver and Reynolds. I just don't like them in the Dark Order. I think if they split off from the Dark Order and were an actual team with a story, I think that would be good. But as Dark Order throwaways, I'm not a fan. Um, so Quinn and Cassidy hit the silly string on Reynolds. Butcher and Blade hit their finisher on Cassidy. Young Bucks jump in, break up the pin every time. Uh, Bucks and Private Party are in for the closing moments of the match. Nick teases a Melsa driver on Cassidy, basically acknowledges FDR. Quinn pulls him off the apron. Cassidy rolls up Matt for what looks like the exact same finish from the first time. Matt reverses the cradle, pull, pulls some tights, and pins Cassidy. FDR goes in the ring after the match, offered Matt and Nick a beer. Uh, they slap the the Bucks slap the beer away. Masked Man jumps in, attacks the Bucks with a chair, and then this this helps FTR to hit a spike pile driver on Nick. Uh, Crash then pilmanized Matt's left leg with a chair, and obviously the Masked Man is totally Blanchard. Referees run in as FTR and Blanchard retreat as the show ended. I'm all for the Bucks and FTR at the pay-per-view, but I will be super, super disappointed if FTR loses the championships because I think there's much more money in the chase. I think there's much more value in a, you know this as a new team, and that's that. So anyway, we'll be back with more right after this. <laughs> 